I'm struggling right now in terms of where the left is uh, post 2020 election. You know, you, you talk about these great leaders and how they're no longer with us. And sometimes things can feel a little hopeless. And so I, I wanted to ask you, you know, you've always had this sense of optimism. And I think it's a huge part of who you are. It's a huge part of your fight. Where do you find that hope from? Yeah, I appreciate the question. Well, I mean, as a blues man in the life of the mind and jazz man in the world of ideas, I've never been either a pessimist or an optimist. I'm a prisoner of hope. And hope is as much a verb as it is a virtue. And therefore, very much like the Ackerman Magazine, I have to stay in motion. I can't be a spectator. I've got to be a participant, engaged in movement, motion, momentum organizing, as well as the reading, reflecting, and writing. And as long as you're in the funk and in the mess of the movement, then the hope is found in seeing people refusing to give up, seeing people fight, seeing people serve others, seeing people sacrifice for something bigger than them. And as long as you're part of that motion and movement, that's where the hope is found. So in that sense, hope is as much an effect of action, probably more than it is a cause of action in that regard. I mean, for me, you know, I, I don't even believe so much in the language of hope. You know, it's just a matter of trying to be a hope. And if you are a hope, you don't talk about hope. Mm. You know, it, it's, yeah. the hope's too abstract. Uh, 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 it's too abstract. It, if your hope in the fleshified sense the concretized sense, the actualized sense of being part of movements, organizing, mobilizing, then you're forever able to move with others in solidarity here and around the world, oppress people in every corner of the globe who are fighting. When you look in their eyes, you look in their hearts, you look in their minds, you see that sparkle, you see that fire, you see that strength, and you say, shoot, I got to keep on moving. Yeah. I to be part of this. But keep in mind, last but not least, you know, Gerda says, he who has never despaired has never lived. And uh, there is no hope without despair. We're wrestling with despair all the time. That just is, that's a sign that we're sensitive to suffering. That's a sign that we're trying to reflect on the suffering to try to alleviate the suffering with our social analysis and with our social practice. Yeah, it's it's it to me what I what I always appreciate about hearing you speak on any show or or, or any platform or, or or read your work is is that you you constantly tie it to something bigger, a bigger struggle. Um, and I find that that's what really gives life meaning is to surrender yourself to a struggle that is bigger than yourself, which is something that's very difficult in the modern time, which everyone, every, everything is catered to our own personal whims in the moment, you know, as a consumer. Um, and it really negates our ability to attach ourselves to something that's bigger than ourselves. And to me, the, the, the thing that really um, provides that for me is to be able to zoom back and, and look at things with a perspective of history. And we live in a, in a moment of one of the most bitter defeats for the left. But often in those defeats in the past, there, there has been um, a sort of darkness before the light moment. I, I, I would like to hear you, your thoughts as to what where we are, you know, at, you know, the Bernie Sanders campaigns of 2016 and 2020 were unimaginable 10 years before or, or even four years before. Um, and now that, that seems like it has opened some, some avenues of possibility um, that were denied to us in, you know, in the dark period of, you know, the early 2000s or the 90s or things like that. Um, where, where, where are you thinking um, right now in terms of um, where we are? I don't appreciate that. One just brief point, though, about um, transcendence, uh, trying to be, be connected to something bigger than us. You know, Rabbi Hesher used to say that we've got to be connected to something that calls us to serve and sacrifice that's larger than us. Yeah. But the problem is the market has colonized 
the dominant form, the transcendent. So people are, we've got careers, opportunism, uh, uh, you know, just market-driven conception of transcendence. So that success, financial prosperity, status, spectacle, celebrity, all those are market forms of colonizing transcendence. And I mean, leftists in all of our varieties, you know, we're calling for non-Marxist forms of transcendence. It could be moral, it could be spiritual, it could be political, it's something bigger than us. It's solidarity, it's justice, it's freedom, it's democracy, equality. And the only way you can concretize that is to sustain different networks, different matrices, different organizations and structures that are countervailing forces against the market-driven form of the transcendence. And that's true for just market-driven forms of university, market-driven forms of civic institutions and so forth. So, so that that becomes a, a launching pad into looking at the grimness of our own moment. Because it's true that, I mean, my God, just, um, you know, 12 months ago, we had hundreds of thousands of people on the street with Black Lives Matter. And that is inseparable from Bernie Sanders' campaign, going back to Occupy, feminist movements highlighting the Me Tooism, anti homophobic movements bringing to bear the kind of uh, dignity for uh, the gay brothers and lesbian sisters and, and queers and trans and non binary precious folk, so that the voices are still there. It's just that the imperial structure, but the empire is just so decadent. Mm -hmm. And uh, the wonderful piece that I read on the ruling class by our dear brother, was it Doug, was it? Doug Henwood. Yeah, I highly recommend folk to read that. And you, you can just see the level of decay of the ruling classes. So that it's just the outright unleashing of gangsterization. And they've always been barbaric. But some barbarians still have certain kinds of constraints. Whereas now the gangsterization of the, of the empire with a ruling class so decayed that it's very difficult for you know, uh, um, social movements to have impact on elites yeah. who are gangster. I mean, hypocrisy is the, is the, is the tribute that vice pays the virtue. So, so if you're a hypocrite, you, at least you still have standards. Where we've got ruling class now, it has no standards at all whatsoever. So, so you can't even call them hypocrites because the gap between virtue and vice is no longer important. They don't care. That's what greed run amok is. You see. And so dealing with that, there's a sense in which you know, we're glad that we have as many voices, organizations, journals on the left in, in some ways. And uh, when you think back of uh, you know, where we were, let's say when I was you all of age, you know, let's say when I was you all of age, I mean, you, you, Reaganism was running amok. The neoliberalism was already taking off. The, the, the imperial militarism was running amok. Mm -hmm. Martin was dead. Malcolm was dead. SDS was pushed to the side. The students were more and more filtering to a mainstream rather than listening to what C. Wright Mills had talked about, what Tom Hayden had talked about, what Barbara Ehrenreich were talking about. We did that mainstreaming and streamlining of the young students in the knowledge factories, which became so tied to big donors, big beneficiaries, big money, uh, uh, and then investing in South Africa. We can go on and on. So there's, there's a sense in which we uh, can acknowledge just how dim things are, but also acknowledge that in the dimness, you've got some folks still fighting with tremendous energy and quality. 
I know it's, I mean, that's incredibly inspiring. And, and that's honestly where I try to draw strength from because you're right about those moments of despair. It's part of being human. It's part of, you know, actually caring about this struggle and being involved in it. But, you know, one of the other things that comes to mind is you mentioned the Reagan era. You know, when I think of the Reagan era, I really think about, you know, the neoliberal era of, of America, like taking off. Um, and now there's a lot more critique and criticism of neoliberalism, which is a good sign. But I think back at the Reagan era and, you know, when you look at the debate that he had with George H.W. Bush on immigration, it sounded like two liberals debating each other on immigration. And, and you see how our discourse on certain issues has actually been regressing over the last uh, few decades. Um, you, you look at the open and overt hatred that's spewed on literally like news outlets today and uh, the lack of any type of shame in, in that kind of discourse or rhetoric. And so, you know, you, you mentioned how we have made some progress, but there's also this underlying system that we're all trying to fight under. And that system has the incentives in the wrong place, right? It incentivizes people um, in, in many cases to kind of abandon uh, the fight for equality, whether it be on social issues or economic issues, for personal gain, personal interests. And honestly, when you think about the need for survival, you almost can't even blame people for doing that. But how do we mitigate that? How do we prevent it from happening? Yeah, but I mean, you know, all we have is um, our traditions and each other, which is to say our movements. So we have to be able to generate sources of insight and sources of inspiration. You need both simultaneously. The insight has to flow from the quality of our social and historical analysis. So that, for example, I mean, to go back to Reaganism versus Trumpism, how do you account for the neo-fascist turn? How do you account for the rawness of the atavism, the rawness of the hatred, the rawness of the contempt? It was already there in Reagan's movement, but it was not as raw. Well, there you have a collapse of a Republican Party. You have a collapse of a certain kind of conservatism that was tied to traditional values, fiscal tightness, uh, 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 suspicion of federal government, and so forth and so on. The underlying common denominator was allegiance to big capital and money, allegiance to militarism abroad, and deeply white supremacists and, and male supremacists, and also anti-Jewish and, and, and anti-homophobic. But the, fasc the neo-fascist version is, is different. Mm. There's no doubt about it, and that's the rawness of it, you see. And, uh, you know, in, in different places, I mean, in Portugal and Spain and Argentina and, Ch and Chile and so forth, you know, they, they've had neo-fascists who have been part of their public life for a long time. Whereas in the United States now, you know, other than black folk dealing with white supremacy, which is, has its own neo-fascist uh, effect, that most Americans are not used to having neo-fascists in public life. So explicit, so raw in their hatred and contempt for those cast as other. So we have to provide insight, historical analysis and social analysis so people can actually see more clearly what's going on. But they also have to be fired up. That's where the inspiration comes in. And that's where the sense, you, know, you can't be Pollyannish, you can't be Disneylandish. They go, oh, we're just gonna turn the corner and we have a revolution. No, 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 no. These are some thugs running things. They will kill your mama. They will lie on you. They will send you to jail. They will crush you. They will undercut your career. They'll do anything. And that's what neo-fascists historically have done across national boundaries. Uh, though each neo-fascism has its historical specifically uh, uh, different qualities relative to context, relative to nation, state, and the economy at a particular moment in any history you see. So, but it's that seeing and that being in movement, that insight and the inspiration that we need. And that's another reason why Jacobin Magazine is so very important. 
because people are hungry and thirsty looking for the real thing. This is what Brother Glenn Ford and I spent so much time, and that's why I love that brother so and, and miss him so. The Black Agenda Report, he's out there all by himself with Margaret and, 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 and Ajamu and a, a few others. And what is he doing? Let's keep track on the decadence of the black bourgeoisie. Let's keep track of the decadence of black neoliberal leadership that's leading black folks suffering so incessantly on every level, psychic, political, economic, leading folk into a dead end. You know, that's the Obama mania and all that other mess, you see. Well, Glenn was carrying a black agenda of port, just like Jacobin, carrying the truth telling and the justice seeking against that kind of mainstream hegemonic way of looking at America and black America. And in the end, more and more people recognize it. Brother Glenn was right. Sister Margaret's right. Brother Jamo tends to be more right than we thought. Jacob is right about these things. I'll be, hey, they seem so far out. They seem so outside of the mainstream, you don't say, because that mainstream is so truncated. You remember this wonderful line from um, Henry James and Robert Louis Stevenson, January 12th, I think it was, 1901. He says, no theory is kind to us that cheats us of seeing. No theory is kind to us that cheats us of seeing. So neo-fascist neo vision, neoliberal vision, they cheat us of seeing. You can't see the suffering. You can't see the structures. You can't see the institutions. You can't see the forms of solidarity that are fighting it. So that if people are locked into neoliberal corporate media, they're not going to see too much. Yeah. They're locked into the, the Fox News. They're not going to see too much. And where do you get the broader comprehensive analysis that allows people to see and then be inspired? That's the real challenge right now. And that's why we've got, we've got to become even more fortified in sustaining institutions like Jacobin. Yeah. You, you mentioned um, the black bourgeoisie um, and uh, there was an article in Jacobin that looked at the uh, the victory of India Walton in in Buffalo um, for mayor. And she actually did better in neighborhoods uh, that were white and Latino than than in her own neighborhood, which was heavily black. And, and I found that interesting, you know, that, the, you know, this uh, a black nurse, uh, radical socialist um, who wins um, on primarily a white and Latino uh, voting base while while the, her, her neighborhood, which is heavily black, um, you know, voted against her. Um, and, you know, similar thing happened with Bernie. Um, it, it went, you know, what, what, what is the, what's, what's the dynamic there? The, the sort of credibility of the black bourgeoisie with, with a, a lot of, uh, black voters to, to deliver, frankly, conservative, um, political out, outcomes, even though they, when you poll black Americans, um, they're, they're they're the they're the some of the most left uh, people on on every issue in the country. How, how does that dynamic work? Yeah, both of y'all ask such wonderful questions. I'm telling you, <laughs> it would, would it be it just reconfirms what I'm saying about. I'm going to clip that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I think it's important to, to keep the context in mind that you see with Bob Moses and Martin King felt. Fannie Lou Hamer, Ella Baker, and the Rabbi Heschels, and the Tom Haydens, because it was a multiracial movement in the 60s, breaking the back of the American apartheid, breaking the back of the old Jim Crow. And it produced two major results. One was the new Jim Crow, which was a mass incarceration of the black masters, the black poor and working class. And then there was the mass incorporation of the black middle classes. And, and with so many of the radical leaders assassinated or incarcerated, it meant then that 
liberal and neoliberal black leadership was viewed as the vanguard of the black freedom movement. Mm. And so with Brother Barack Obama, you get the, uh, uh, the height of success in the American empire. He's running the whole empire. Well, that's a major shadow cast. Now, what did he do about the new Jim Crow and the mass incarceration? What did he do about the unbelievable class collapse in, in terms of schools and education and health care and housing for the black masses? Now, he made it worse. Mm -hmm. He made it worse because he went with Wall Street. He bailed out Wall Street. But the model of black success became that black presidency. And so the black politicians imitate and emulate his neoliberal politics, thinking that's the way to win elections. That's what we ran up against with Brother Bernie. How can we account for the fact that the most progressive presidential candidate in the 20th century was not supported by the most progressive voting bloc in America, namely the black voting bloc? Why? Because the Obama shadow was cast so deeply that we, myself and Nina Turner and Danny Glover and a host of black folk, we could not push effectively against that Obama shadow, that Obama effect, which goes back to the mass incorporation of especially the black middle classes into liberal and neoliberal politics and into being well-adjusted to an unjust empire and well adapted to an indifferent set of elites, no matter what color they are. Mm -hmm. So to make the elites more colorful, more black, more brown, keep the empire in place, keep the predatory capitalist system in place, and things will be better. I mean, that's that's part of the neoliberal message. You see? So that what is happening now, and this I'm on my way for Sister Nina Turner up. Uh, running in Cleveland. We got the election coming up on Tuesday. I'm going to spend five days there with her. We're going to do 12 events every day the way we did with Bernie, right? And Bernie's going to be there too. God bless him. Bernie will be there too on Saturday at the rally, trying to deal with a moribund, milquetoast, neoliberal, corporate-dominated Democratic Party mm -hmm. that progresses on its edges. But most of the energy of the party is found among the progressives. It's found with the quad and so forth. And, and, and Nina Turner is, is a you know, major voice, figure, brilliant, visionary uh, politician wrestling with that dilemma, as it were. And it's a very, very tough race. So that uh, the sad thing in, in, in conclusion is that the, uh, there's a, a, a sleepwalking. There's a neoliberal sleepwalking among Black leadership that has tremendous impact on black voters. And keep in mind that you know, probably the majority of black folks don't vote at all because that's another kind of statement, right? Another right. kind of uh, expression in, in and of itself. But things, things are shifting now. Things are shifting. I know I, uh, in my own, my own work, you know, 10 years ago, you know, I used to have black folks say, you have lost your mind critical of the black president. You ought to be shaming yourself. I'll go back to these same contexts, these same sites, and they'll say, I called you everything but a child of God, but I said you were telling the truth. I said, well, I've been saying the same thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I remember that. Yes. I remember that yes. very well, yeah. Yes. 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 Um, you know, you mentioned Nina Turner and the uh, congressional race for Ohio's 11th district, and I, I do want to talk about that a little bit because, you know, there wasn't really much attention paid to that race until it was very clear that Nina Turner was in fact going to win the Democratic primary there. Uh, that was when Hillary Clinton got involved and gave the endorsement. And I mean, nobody really, I mean, I don't think anybody's really excited about a Hillary Clinton endorsement, but what that came along with was a lot of corporate cash. 
And you mentioned Senator Bernie Sanders and how he's planning on, um, you know, rallying for Nina, which is wonderful. But on the other side, with Chantel Brown, who's the you know neoliberal candidate who's up against uh, Nina Turner, you have uh, Representative Jim Clyburn, who's going to be doing some campaigning for her. I bring him up because he has certainly gone out of his way to carry the carry out the best interests of Joe Biden. And Joe Biden has turned around and, you know, failed to deliver anything that Clyburn had wanted, really. Um, They're not going to do away with the filibuster. Biden isn't calling for the Senate to do away with the filibuster, which essentially stalls any important legislation that Clyburn or any other Democrat might want. So what's your response to that? And what do you think the influence of corporate money in that election is likely to do? Well, can be one that there is an increasing conflict and cleavage between black neoliberals and white neoliberals like Biden or Kamala Harris, who's on Biden's side. Because by Biden's refusal to hit the filibuster head on so that voting rights suppression is somehow secondary and tertiary for neoliberal black politicians, voting rights is number one. Now, it's still too narrow, it's still too truncated, but voting rights still are very important. And so you get more and more tension between Biden and his black neoliberal supporters. You can see it even on, 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 in the media and so forth. The critique of Biden. Now, it's not a structural critique. It's not a leftist critique. It's just that Biden's making it very clear that he's not going to touch the filibuster. And if you don't touch the filibuster, you are allowing the shadow of Jim Crow within the political, the political sphere to expand. And, and, and neoliberal black politician can't put up with that. Not at all. Now, exactly where that will go is an open question, because in the situation of Cleveland, Ohio, 11, where you have... Nina Turner, who is a bona fide progressive, who is very critical of Biden, not just when it comes to his refusal to hit the filibuster head on, but also his allegiance to Wall Street, his allegiance to the Pentagon, his promoting the predatory capitalism and the militarism abroad, a broader critique within the electoral political system. She then gets targeted by corporate money, as you rightly say, tied to the Hillary endorsement, you see. She gets targeted by those concerned about her being critical of American militarism. Mm -hmm. Not just in Africa and Latin America, but in the Middle East. So you get a lot of our deeply neoliberal and right-wing Jewish brothers and sisters in their uncritical defense of Israel, pouring big money in. And, uh, uh, and, and once you get that kind of uh, coming together of neoliberals against a genuine progressive like Nina Turner, then it becomes very clear who's on which side, because it's not just Clyburn, it's the whole Black Congressional Caucus. At least most of the Black Congressional Caucus have come out for the neoliberal candidates. And I was glad to see AOC and, 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 and a few others come out for, uh, for Nina, and we want to see even more, we hope this weekend. But it just, again, allows us to see more clearly, you know, uh, who is allied with whom when it comes to the three fundamental sources we must always highlight. Wall Street, Pentagon, and xenophobic ideologies and sensibilities. White supremacists, male supremacists, anti-Jewish, anti-Muslim, anti-Arab, homophobic. And yeah. I, I, you mentioned the the uprisings uh, that were just 12 months ago, and it seem they seem like forever ago at this point. But um, the two largest sort of street demonstrations of my lifetime were the anti-Iraq war protests and the mm-hmm. protests that emerged after the, the murder of George Floyd. And it strikes me that, you know, in, in both cases, um, they were huge and, and all over the streets, but with and. And in both cases, like, you know, the Iraq war raged on and, you know, the, the racism of the criminal justice system rages on as well. But the, the difference in the reaction from 
the power structures to them, to me, are, are quite striking in that the Iraq war protests were successfully, successfully marginalized uh, by corporate and, and government, uh, you know, power structures to make them look like ridiculous fringe people, even though there was, you know, millions of people on the street. With George Floyd protests, we've seen a sort of absorption of the energy by corporate America. Mm -hmm. um, and it's almost commoditized a certain language about race, um, that a, a sort of a certain radical language around race that has been become okay um, to be used within the context of say like a JP Morgan ad or uh, you know, Raytheon doing uh, you know, race uh, trainings in their in, in their you know, in their corporate retreats. Um, I, I, I was just curious what, what your reaction to that, to that phenomenon has been. Yeah, I mean, one, you're always going to get a very different reaction to imperial militarism than you are domestic of uh, racism. Hmm. Because in the latter, you can't talk about American culture without talking about black culture. You see, the whole nation has been Afro-Americanized when it comes to culture, when it comes to music. Music's a dominant form of transcendence in late capitalist civilization, especially for young people, you see. So that you have to hit that in some way head on. And that's part of the mass incorporation I was talking about. You've got to absorb it. You've got to dilute the radical demands in order to get people to adapt and adjust to a status quo. So it becomes what I call, I mean, I talk about this in terms of my own Harvard situation, where you bring in the black professors, you make them the public face of your institution, but it looks like you're so multicultural, looks like you're so concerned about racism, diversity, equity, inclusion is the words you use over and over and over again. And it ends up just Jim Crow new style under market conditions in professional managerial context. Because in terms of who actually makes the most fundamental decisions, in terms of who is accountable to whom, it's still very much a white supremacist affair. It's still very much a white supremacist male affair in some ways. Even though you can make it more gender inclusive too and keep the hierarchy in place, keep the oppressive structure still in place. And corporations have to do the same thing. So the first thing you begin, you begin with symbolic gestures. Oh my God, we've hired some, we've hired three black folk in the last week. Oh my God, we've changed the name of monuments. Oh my God, we've got our commercials now with black faces. Don't you see our responding? <laughs> oh my, we, 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 we're undergoing a revolution here. Let's have a party. Let's celebrate diversity. Please get off the crack pipe, spare me. <laughs> we're talking about sharing of power in structures. That's democratizing. They're talking about racially, multirationally commodified is not the same as power sharing in forms of democratized. Very different things. Very different things. And so the, you're, you, you, I think you're right that the, uh, the, the protests have opened up new opportunities for black middle class jobs, just like they opened up new opportunities for certain black professors. But then the question becomes, if it's, if it's Jim Crow new style, what does that mean? Are you going to respect the professors who are there? How long are the new folk in corporate America really going to last? How high will they go? If they go to the top, will they have already so thoroughly reshaped and refashioned themselves in the corporate elites that they might as well be white anyway? <laughs> in terms of their actions and behaviors, in terms of how they spend their money and deploy their power, and so forth. See, those are the kind of questions that are very important, not just for leftists, because I think we have to be very, very honest and bold about our leftist vision analysis. It's not just a leftist analysis, it's a quest for the truth. Mm -hmm. And the condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. The Negro National Anthem is lift every voice. That's a democratic spirit. Every voice must be lifted. You got all these masses of voices out here that are not heard. Poor and working class, you're not lifting, you're not, you're not listening to those voices. They're not choosing poverty. They're not choosing jobs that don't have, don't have a living wage. They're not choosing indecent housing. They're not choosing unavailable health care. They're not choosing what these schools look like 
so decrepit and so forth. So their voices are not being heard. And so in that sense, that's for me, and you all know, you know, my own revolutionary Christian uh, view about this thing is that, uh, I mean, it's, it's leftist in terms of being on an ideological spectrum, but I'm concerned about the truth. I'm concerned about justice. I'm concerned about goodness. I'm concerned about beauty. The Prince produced some beautiful music. He got his new album dropping today, right? Welcome to America. You all know the story about how he and I had this debate about, I said, Prince, you my dear brother, you a genius, but you ain't no Curtis Mayfield. <laughs> <laughs> so he went in the studio and made some Curtis Mayfield music, Born to Die. Sound just like Moments in Superfly, part of his genius. But he's concerned about truth and beauty and goodness. He just happens to land with a leftist critique of a decaying American empire shot through with greed and hatred and that vicious form of the white supremacy that so often are isolated from predatory capitalism mm -hmm. and imperial militarism. See, that's the critiques of Coates and company because they want to fetishize and, and reify race and white supremacy so that that's the fundamental issue. And it is mm -hmm. a crucial issue. But if it's not tied to a critique of the hierarchies of empire and capitalism, it's just a neoliberal face posing as so progressive, posing as so, so radical. It ain't in the end that courageous just to talk about how racist America is. Now, I know that Kamala Harris has trouble with it. She said we're not even a racist country. Biden said we're not a racist country. Clyde Burr said we're not a racist country, just racist pockets. And it all started with Tim Scott. We're not a racist country. You say, oh, my God. If, if we're in that kind of denial, then we're really in deep trouble. Mm -hmm. So to come along and say America's racist, which I agree with Coates and the others, yes, that's true. But that's just a starting point. And if you don't go further with your critiques of empire and predatory capitalism, you're going to end up reproducing structures of domination that are going to continually weigh heavily on the black masses as you go off and live in your mansion and buy your second house in Martha's Vineyard and get your new jobs in a new university with millions of dollars and think that somehow you're on the cutting edge of being the vanguard of black liberation. No, you're just doing well financially and, and, and successful in an unjust society. You know, you talk about systems of, of domination, and it's certainly true within our borders. And it's also very true outside of our borders, where the United States, uh, through our foreign policy, um, goes against the will of people in various countries. We topple governments, uh, you know, leaders who have been democratically elected. Right now, a big story is um, the whistleblower, Daniel Hale, the one who leaked documents informing the American public about America's disgusting drone war abroad. He just got sentenced to 45 months in prison. We know what happens to whistleblowers these days if they uh, you know, do anything courageous in informing the public about the wrongdoings of the Pentagon. Um, then you also see the type of discourse taking place in regard to the protests in Cuba. And what's fascinating to me is while there is a bit of an awakening in regard to human rights abuses within our borders, there's still a significant portion of the country that thinks that it's totally OK to, you know, criti not only criticize you know, perceived human rights abuses or actual human rights abuses abroad, but say that we need to do airstrikes or use military force in response to that. Um, but like, wh why is it that there's still kind of this illusion of, of freedom within our borders? Because I think that that's not really the case. We saw the way some of those protesters were treated last summer, you know, getting snatched up by federal agents and thrown into unmarked vans. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that you'd expect to see in the countries that we bomb, right? Um, what can we do to kind of further the awakening about what's actually happening in our borders and what we need to do to actually address that rather than, you know, talk about toppling governments we don't like? Right. No, indeed, indeed. See, I think that the 
deeper one finds oneself in genuine struggle for freedom uh, is the more readier one sees just how aggressive the repressive apparatus of the U.S. nation state is. So, so I mean, we talked about we started with Bob Moser, get beat by White Brother Castle, months in jail. We got H. Rap Brown right now, Tucson, Arizona, forty some years. Imam Jamil, Mumia Abu Jamal, Sada Shakur, so many who got deeply involved in genuine struggle for freedom and found themselves up against ugly repression. And they didn't have to go outside of the borders to find that repression. Same would be true in terms of our precious uh, brothers and sisters coming in from Mexico and the issues of them to the immigrants, the precious immigrants. You'll see just how repressive things are. Same is true in terms of our radical trade unionists. And, and, and for even for intellectuals, I mean, good God Almighty, you know, uh, uh, I was just reading about uh, old brother Ray Ginger and his wife Ann Fagan and, and Carol Weiss King. I mean, these were folk in the 40s who were wiped out by Harvard and other places because of the McCarthyism, and they were fighting for folk who were on their ways to jail. Carol Weiss King needs to be remembered as one of the great lawyers concerned with the vicious repressive apparatus of the nation state. Well, you look at her life and you see what's going on now with immigrants, you say, oh my God, there's continuity in terms of repression. Absolutely. But, but I do want to say this though, in terms of what happens outside of our borders, that we have to be morally consistent in our defense of everyday people. When I take the case of Cuba, for example, I was just blessed to sign this, uh, this statement to let Cuba live on behalf of uh, uh, the calling for the lifting of the sanctions. The sanctions have been immoral, they're barbaric, they're vicious, and so forth and so on. But at the same time, you see, if there were a, a letter that accented the Cuban government also being accountable to its people. So dissident voices that are being raised, being incarcerated and so forth. But that's authoritarian policies of the Cuban government. I would support that too. And they would say, well, Brother West, how can you sign both of them? Because I'm trying to be consistent. The, the people themselves are suffering. The fundamental sources of the suffering have to do with imperial sanctions. It has to do with the ways in which the Cuban revolution had been circumscribed and so forth, but then the Cuban government itself must be made accountable and therefore the critiques must be made of any authoritarian policy vis-a-vis -vis ordinary people inside of Cuba. I know when I went to Cuba in 1982, uh, I lectured about 25 times, it must have been about the 22nd time, he said, Brother West, you sound like a counter-revolutionary. I said, well, what am I saying? Well, you said that people ought to have the right to raise their voices and be critical of Fidel. I said, yes, I believe elites ought to rotate. And I said that on television. The elites rotate. You call up for Castro to rotate? That's right. They need to rotate. Well, that sounds kind of relevant. I don't know what you call it, but all I'm saying is I've come here to defend the Cuban people. And to the degree to which I'm at a critique of U.S. imperialism, which has been vicious, they get patting me on the back. Oh, Brother West, we appreciate that. You tell us, well, I'm trying to tell the truth. You and I had a critique of the Cuban government. Oh, they came at me tooth and nail. Same was true with the racism in Cuba. We solved the race, we've, we've solved the race problem. Get off the crack pipe. No, you haven't, but you've made some major moves and let's work at it together. But the racism is still operating. So that you had to be honest and candid in such a way that you're not, you hope you're not just used by the right wing because you got folk, you know, in Florida, the right wing, Cubans in Florida. Well, you know, West is on our side, at least on this part, but he's on the other side. Well, it's just a matter of trying to be consistent. I'm not trying to make sides in this regard. We love the Cuban people, period. How do you keep track of this stuff? Thank you for that. Okay. that was yeah. Great. No, and Dr. West, I think you've been very generous with your time. I think before we let you go, you're, you're, you said you're heading off uh, to go campaign for Nina Turner. Um, if you 
had a message to deliver to our viewers about who Nina is, uh, what she's like, and, and why you support her, I think that'd be great. Oh, yes. Well, I mean, first I want to say that we must do all we can to keep alive the higher standards of moral, spiritual, and political excellence represented by Jacobin Magazine who has to do with truth telling and justice seeking. So it's very important. It really is. I mean, it's like trying to keep alive the best of the jazz tradition. You see, how are you going to keep that alive? Don't say a word about Charlie Parker. Don't say a word about Sarah Vaughan. Don't say a word about Louis Armstrong. Don't say a word about Mary Lou Williams. You got to keep the standards up. And that's exactly what you all are able to do in terms of the history. It can't just be contemporary events. Tell the whole genealogy of the ruling class of the American empire now in this decadent moment, this Negro <laughs> necrotic moment, as he noted in that thing, you see. It's dying from the inside. You gotta tell a larger story. So it is with our elected officials that we go to Cleveland. We go to support Nina Turner. Why? Because she is a wave in a grand ocean of a black progressive tradition that goes hand in hand with the U.S. progressive tradition and the international progressive tradition. And she is this crucial person at this moment that's trying to hold up a bloodstained banner of truth telling and justice seeking that have to do with moral, spiritual, and political standards of excellence. And that excellence is manifesting how deep is your love for everyday people? Do you look at the world through the lens of poor and working people? I don't care what color they are. I was just blessed to write the uh, 60th anniversary for uh, Franz Fanon's Retreat of the Earth. I got a chance to read it twice. It had to be out in a couple of months. And what is one of the fundamental points he makes there? The massive betrayal and pervasive neglect of poor and working people of national bourgeoisies in every corner of the world, including the United States, including black America. Nina, Nina Turner, I was gonna say Nina Simone because they really go hand in hand in terms of their spirit, <laughs> their vision, their courage, their style, their willingness to tell the truth, right? Is concerned about that kind of betrayal and neglect of poor and working people on behalf of politicians, including black politicians, including black neoliberal politicians, like the one she's running against. That's why I go down to see Nina Turner in the spirit of Nina Simone.